Namaskaram. Hey, how are you? How are you? <laughs> very, oh, well. very good. How are you doing? Very well. How are you doing, man? Perfect. I just <laughs> just got off uh, my motorcycle. I run my dog around my property on a motorcycle. So, uh, what are you riding, huh? I've got a off-road vehicle, uh, off-road Suzuki, but I'm waiting for a electric Harley. Um, so I think I think we share some motorcycle um, love <laughs> for sure. Two wheels better than four wheels. Huh? <laughs> it's it's the way to be connected. Uh, I was very very uh, happy to see that you took that journey through the U.S. What what in, well, we have a couple, we have a few little loves. One is um, planting trees. I just planted a bunch of trees and started a program of uh, about 6,500 trees here in California and have a mission of 20 million in the savannah of Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, and then I heard about your, your big uh, tree dream. Uh, so I'd love to hear about that and what inspired that. And then the third thing off from motorcycles is just inner knowledge, uh, inner freedom, inner liberation. It's always been a, a something <laughs> that I love studying and love to know more of who I really am. And um, so I was really excited to talk to you on several levels. Um, so I, I think, yeah, tell me about the motorcycle part first. What inspired you uh, to take that journey? Well, uh, I've been riding since I was 11 years of age, <laughs> so <laughs> I crisscrossed India on my motorcycle at one time, but wow. almost 28 years or 20, nearly 28 years plus, I never sat on a motorcycle, nor did I uh, think of one. But uh, three years ago when I was doing this uh, Rally for Rivers event, where uh, I drove from southern India to Himalayas from the southern tip, to Himalayas covering 16 states, wow. gathering the support of 162 million people for changing the river policy in the country, which we managed to do, fortunately. Wow. Uh, at that time, somebody brought a motorcycle and said, Sadhguru, why don't you ride? I was just wondering, can I ride? Because I've not even sat on a motorcycle for 28 years. Well, I sat on it and then I saw not a day has been lost. So, since then I am having trouble getting into cars, so I am on a motorcycle. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so so you got inspired again in India. And then what was the inspiration to come to America and ride and visit ad indigenous people here and understand that obviously you have a strong environmental pull? Um, what inspired that trip? Well, this is almost 17, 18 years ago, I was uh, in this Tennessee area where I had a very profound touching experience with the Native American spirit. This will sound a little woolly if you look at it just logically, but it was uh, probably one of the most painful moments ever in my life when I saw this state of the person that there was. Then that's when I started discovering what happened in this region. Then I found out this region is known as the Trail of Tears, where the Cherokee were removed with the Removal Act. So I decided to set up the center here. So our center is at the head of the Trail of Tears, somewhere close to that. And uh, as a part of that, I've been thinking I should meet the other nations. Well, it was an eye-opener for me to see that there were over 500 nations in the United States with over 25 million people when the Europeans came in. So, uh, I thought uh, this is a phenomenal culture, but being a oral culture, not writing down anything, if a few generations, two, three generations miss out, the entire thing gets wiped out. Nearly 40,000 years of uh, history and civilization of theirs, almost gone, invisible in the world, so I've been thinking I should make them more visible and make them relevant to today's world. So one important cause was uh, to make them visible, because most people's idea of a Native American person is what they have seen in the Wild West movies. Beyond that, they have, they, nobody knows anything. Nobody knows, I'm telling you, in the world, not even a minuscule population in the world knows 
that there were over 500 nations with different languages, with different cultural practices, with different spiritual practices, every one of them having their own individual language. So this is completely unknown, because this is a oral culture, if you don't speak about it, it will die. And already it's become a minuscule, uh, so I thought I should give them some uh, visibility in the world, that's one thing. And another aspect is, see today ecology means uh, it's kind of a textbook science, people are looking at it like some abstraction. But this is a culture where uh, they did not talk about protecting the earth, they are the earth. Ecology is in their hearts, not in their books. So this, if it doesn't happen to this generation and the next generation, if ecology is not in our hearts, well, you can get a PhD in ecology, but you will be ruining it anyway. So, uh, I think they are very, very relevant for this generation and the coming generations, if we want to turn a few things around in this world, which is an express need right now. Yeah, it's almost like... Um... We've, we've, we've messed a lot of things up in our modern day world, clearly. Uh, the earth is screaming. Um, and I really, really love uh, that you've got back in touch with especially the natives here in America are the representation of earth and sky. And I studied with several natives uh, throughout my 20s. Um, and I remember, just funny that you say that, because I met Wallace Black Elk, who's from Black Elk lineage, and he was 89 years old, and he brought me into a lodge, and he said, I don't understand why kids have their books on their backs when everything is right here to ask spirit to give that knowledge and that wisdom. And I never forgot that moment. Uh, just like you said, to study ecology from studying, but to be it and live it in your heart, it's a completely different thing. And, and Wallace Blackelt said basically the same thing you just said, um, and it's never left me. Um, and it has turned me into doing everything I can to support a better planet. Um, I really love that. Um, I wish I would have known I would have raced out and met you on the path uh, Not somewhere. on your little Suzuki, huh? <laughs> no, 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 a, diff a different one, a different, <laughs> a different one. We would have got that electric Harley sooner, I guess. Um, and yeah, so what was after all of but that? electric Harley, how long will it run without recharge? Um, they say it's always questionable whether the, as you know, actual in the world, they say 90 miles full highway and they say 120 in city so oh then by now you would be drying up in the mojave desert if you came on a <laughs> electric harley <laughs> that's, that's, that's true i think you'd probably have to put extra batteries behind you or something but uh at least they're making the effort right um yeah so very beautiful and 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 so the 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 what do you think that staying on that topic of the Native Americans, obviously there's a lot of despair. I spent a lot of time uh, in uh, uh, the South Dakota. I had my grandmother uh, was born in 1901 and, and interacted with friendly Indians. Uh, she, t she told me that story before she passed away. Um, what, what do you think then from your experience, what's the best thing that we can do to support and everyone listening to support the Native Americans, not only the way that they're living is not acceptable, um, many of them, and also to help support their culture. W what do you think that we can do and, and everyone See, one listening? One thing is, uh, uh, considering their last 300 years of history, they have a huge problem trusting anybody. Uh, because of what they've gone through and uh, a serial breaking up of uh, treaties that were made and agreements that were made and still being broken like that. Yeah. So one simple thing is just this, anyway, if not all, a whole lot of them still have a reservation. 
these reservations uh, are there, but slowly people are buying up the land. You know, in many reservations, the laws have been made to allow outsiders to buy the land. This means in another twenty-five years, there will be no reservation. Is reservation a relevant thing? That question is being raised everywhere. Now, only twenty-five percent of the Native American population is living in reservations. If you convert reservations into, you know, using the Native American skills and whatever, to represent that culture, become like tourist hubs, you know, people can go there, stay there, in those kind of conditions and experience that life, go through those rituals, whatever, at least four months in a year, if it uh, goes on like a big tourism process, and I feel uh, in the world there's a lot of interest in these things. So if you train them, instead of trying to simply get them to become part of the m mainstream, because they have a certain love for their culture and they're hanging on to it, and they cannot survive without making that culture a presentable product by itself. Because there has to be an economic activity. A few of them are doing very well. For example, the Cherokee moved from here to Oklahoma. Even there they are doing well because they were quite well versed in their agriculture and they had a language, you know, written language of their own. So they have transformed even the new place into a very uh, worthwhile thing for themselves. But not everybody has been able to do that because varying levels of support or no support or opposition in different states because the state laws are different and the attitudes are different. So the important thing is they must be allowed to run their own schools, which will also prepare them for moder modern life at the same time train them in their traditional ways of living, particularly their language. If they don't keep the language, well, English language can be compulsory, but they must also learn their language because this being a oral culture, without language, the entire thing will die. If the Native American population, I think right now, uh, a certain amount, if I don't know what's the percentage, but significant amount of population cannot speak the language because they studied only in English schools outside. And uh, hardly they went back to the reservations. Those who are in connection, in, co in contact, they have picked up the language, others have not. Once you kill the language, the entire culture will vanish because it's an oral culture, nothing is written down. So these things, if we take care, we can preserve that anyway, those times are over of them being the, you know, uh, massive culture here. But at least preserve it for the value of what it is because something that was developed over ten, twenty thousand years, it is not nice to just wipe it out like that. Yeah, thank you. It brings up a lot of um, a lot of things to consider. And you feel like many of them that you've met are open to developing some sort of way that they can demonstrate their culture, teach the culture and have people come and celebrate that and, and a type of tourism. Do you feel like many of them are open to those kinds of ideas? See, the younger generation is open, but as I said, it's very fear based because yeah. it's only somewhere in 1970s, I think, that they became proper citizens of this country with rights and everything. Today, they are proper uh, citizens of United States. So now they have all the rights. Unless the young people become empowered with education, they will not know how to uh, access these rights, how to make use of these rights for their well-being. Right now, the only one thing which seems to have succeeded largely for many of these tribes is that uh, this casino business. The casino business may be in economically a good thing, but culturally that could be more damaging than anything else for them, because the kind of culture and atmosphere that it brings, it's all right on the fringes if you do it, but if that is the main thing, I don't think the youth will go in the right direction. That is a sure way of killing the culture. But as I said, there is a certain amount of distrust, and also, there is a fear of appropriation of their cultures. So, this fear should go and they must understand internationally their products. For example, their crafts are so fine, you know, the pottery and the horsehair pottery, whatever they've done is like very fine. I've traveled everywhere in the world, nowhere else they're making this sort of, you know, this type of pottery which is so refined. So even in desert lands, they're making this kind of pottery, which is fantastic. All this can go worldwide. So if United States government forms some kind of a 
foundation, but that won't be trusted. Somebody uh, in... Uh, like in California, some of you guys get together, form a foundation. I've been talking to various leaders, telling them, see, you don't have to agree with each other. You don't have to uh, do anything with each other. Just once a year, all the tribes just meet in a conference. Don't do anything. Just play some music, dance around, eat a meal, share a meal with each other and go home. But if you do this year on year, after some time you will come to something because presenting 500 faces to the world is an extremely difficult thing to do. If you present one face with 500 limbs to it, we can do that. But 500 faces is not going to work. So I've been trying to talk to them, there is a certain reservation, the younger people saying very excited about this, but the older generation is fearful because they've gone through a certain life process, unfortunate uh, ways of experiencing life. But if we don't work towards presenting a single face, it can have all its... see, this is a single hand but has five fingers, they don't... not in conflict. If we don't do that, well, uh, if it becomes invisible to the world, it's as soon... as good as gone, you know, that should not happen. So I feel some kind of a platform, a loose platform where they can come together. So, you know, it can also be a commercial expo kind of thing where a big event happens where they bring all their wares and sell it for, let's say, one week, expo exposition happens, people can travel, it becomes a, a touristic attraction. Uh, like, for example, right now that Vegas is big uh, tourist attraction. Somewhere close by in Sedona or some place like that, if you have a week-long Native American exposition, one day all the leaders meeting just uh, for togetherness, rest of the time it's a commercial enterprise, if they do that, I think it'll build up in stature. I've been talking to people, but... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> I, I tell you, I, I, I really want to um, uh, see what there's some... there's something to do there. I, I, I would love to be involved with something like that. And, and uh, yeah, like, keep me... keep me informed. I'd love to stay connected with you and your team on that. And maybe there's... Um, uh, I, like I said, I've visited those cultures several times, and, and if there's something we can do to support them... I See, right now, there that. is no one place where you can connect right. with all of them. You have to go to 500 places to connect with them. Right. right. So, that part of it itself is a onerous yeah. task. Yeah. So, so incredible, and, and yeah, it is, a, it is a big task. So, shifting gears a bit to your, your tree initiatives, because I resonate with that. I literally, this weekend, we planted over 100 trees in... I lost my home to the 2018 Woolsey Fire. I'm, I'm in nature. Uh, I have over 1,000 trees on my property. Uh, California, obviously, is being hit. A, a, along with a lot of other pl places on the globe with fire. And so getting back and getting native plants in the ground, where did your uh, big tree initiative come from and, and uh, how was that inspired? And, and what are you doing to mobilize the 830 billion trees that you want to uh, plant in, in the earth? See, uh, <clears throat> it started uh, in uh, sometime 1998 when a UN agency came to southern India and made a prediction, the state in which we are living, which is called as Tamil Nadu, will become... 60% of it will become a desert by 2025, that's what they said. I did not like or I don't like any predictions for that matter because predictions don't take into account what is uh, beating in human hearts, okay? They're going by cold statistics. So I wanted to see for myself, is this true? So I drove around all over looking for this. Then I saw that it could happen much sooner than 2025 because many rivers, major rivers had dried up, all streams dried up, tributaries gone. So people were building uh, buildings in the riverbeds because there's no hope of water coming back, that kind of situation. So I was just thinking what to do, then I saw the green cover in the state was only 16.5 percent. The national aspiration is 33 percent. So I made a simple calculation that if you want to get it to 33 percent, you need to plant 114 million trees. So I called a group of our volunteers and said, 114 million trees we need to plant if we want to revive all this. Their eyeballs rolled and they said, 114 million trees, how do we do this? 
Do you know what that number is? So the simple thing is this, the population of the state is sixty-two million. I said you are sixty-two million people. If all of us plant one tree today, take care of it for two years and plant one more, the number is done. The only problem is, you're not able to mobilize the people to act. Everybody is using everything, but when it comes to compensatory action, they think it's not theirs. So I said, this is what we need to do. So how to do this then as an experiment to show them that it works? I planted six million seeds in the uh, mountains, which was completely shaved, shaved off twenty years ago of all timber, illegally taken off. So I said, see, this can be done. In twenty-three days, six million trees we put, it's seeds, but nearly over ninety-five percent uh, success because the land is so rich and uh, it's a rainforest. Only one side of the hill was gone, right behind our center. Our temperatures were at least three to four degrees higher than the city. But today, if you come in peak summer, our temperatures are minimum three degrees less than the city, simply because these twenty-year-old trees are all standing there. Now, all the trees in this hill are twenty years old, but if you see in the other parts of the hills, they're all very old trees. Mm. So this is… this I just want to demonstrate, all we did was, I gave them a song to sing and uh, two meals to eat, that's it. Twenty-three days we planted this many trees, I evolved a very special kind of uh, device as to how to plant these seeds in a successful manner. These are simple things that people don't do innovations, the when you plant a uh, seed, the thing is, the animals will walk on it and it won't sprout because it gets packed up. The, uh, the, it's a very clayey black soil. So we just put a cone and put little sand and uh, put a seed and put little sand on it. So all the seeds sprouted and nearly wow. over ninety to ninety-five percent have survived and they're all twenty-year-old trees. So using that as an example, then when I spoke to larger groups of people, they all said, why should we do it? And they have their own problems, farmers. You know, they have their daily… daily bread is a problem. So, where is the question of saving the planet? So, I… they made… they did a simple spiritual process for them. Sit under the trees and made them breathe. As you… what you exhale, the trees are inhaling. What the trees exhale, you are inhaling. Once it became a living experience for them, now you can't stop them from planting trees everywhere it's going on. We have planted as a part of this, this was called as the Green Hands Project. So, we planted over thirty-eight million trees, all in private lands, okay? All in private lands. Private land is important because the survival rate is very, very high. This is not afforestation, this is more tree-based agriculture. But there were issues with the policy that in India there were policies which are not supportive for tree-based agriculture, because simply activism is happening. If you grow a tree in your own land and cut it for your need someday, a uh, police could come and arrest you, activists will protest in front of your uh, house, all these kind of things. Last seven years, we kind of battled with the government and changed all these laws. Now there are digital portals where if you have registered the tea, tree as growing in your land, it's for you to use it whichever way you want. Based on this, now we are moving into a very large-scale tree-based agriculture, we have taken one river basin, which is eighty-three thousand square kilometers, and uh, here we need two point four two billion trees to go into it, for it to become, you know, to revive the river. This is a perennial river been running for we don't know how how long, millions of years, but in the last twenty-five years, it is uh, about four to four and a half months, up to five months, the river is drying up hundred and seventy-five kilometers short of the ocean. So, this was an extremely rich uh, delta region where agriculture was prime. But today, they are all in poverty, farmers are migrating, hundreds of them committing suicide, or three hundred thousand farmers have committed suicide in the last twenty years. So, as a part of this, we started this movement. The important thing was, first three years when you're shifting to semi-tree-based uh, agriculture, there is a certain loss of revenue for first three to four years. So, we wanted a subsidy from the government to support them for the first four years. Now we manage the subsidy, state governments are giving subsidy. Now there is no stopping. This year, in spite of the pandemic, we planted eleven million trees, all on private land. Wow! Okay? Next year, the goal is somewhere between thirty-five to forty-five million trees. 
because now there is government subsidy and we've relaxed the policy that you can grow and cut your trees when you want. Now, we are seeing this that it'll happen. We were looking at other river basins also, but fortunately now the federal government has taken up 13 rivers on the same model as uh, Kaveri calling uh, is what the project was, this one river. They are... they have prepared detailed project reports for 13 rivers across the country. River basins are revived means it's like a living proof. We are working with the United Nations agencies. They are saying, Sadhguru, if you make this one thing success, this is the solution for the entire tropical world. Because the farmer's income goes up 300 to 800 percent in five to seven years' time. We have converted 70,000 farmers in the last 22 years, and they are the living proof for this larger module that we are putting it up. As a part of this, being in the... I'm being a part of the economic... World Economic Forum, there they wanted to launch a trillion trees project, trillion tree campaign, because some professor came up with a calculation, if you plant trillion trees in ten years' time, fifty years of carbon that we have let out into the atmosphere will be sequestered. Well, it's a great idea and the number is just an inspiring number, it's not about one trillion. But where will you plant? Unless you are on the ground, you are able to inspire farmers to do it. In India, eighty-four percent of the land is owned by the farmer. If you don't plant there, where will you plant? The question of increasing forest cover is simply not practical without reducing human populations. It is only possible that you must go into farmland and plant. If you f plant into farmland, it must be more lucrative for the farmer than regular monocrops. That is when he will go for it. So a simple thing is, I see that you are also involved in this, so let me state this. For example, fifty-one million square kilometers of land is farmland on this planet. Out of this, forty million square kilometers of land is used for raising animals or their food. So people don't have to give up if the world reduces fifty percent of their meat consumption, you will have twenty million square kilometers of land to grow trees and tree-based agriculture. This will change everything. Mm -hmm. This all that needs to happen. And America is most important because only U.S. citizens are consuming hundred and fifteen kilograms of meat per... average meat per year. The next uh, closest one is 81 kilograms by United Kingdom. In India, people consume 3.7 kilograms of meat. You don't have to go there instead of 115, if you come to 50 kilograms, world will change, I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And above all, your medical bills will come down, America's medical bills will come down. It's ridiculous, an affluent country where there's enormous choice of nourishment and lifestyles, we are spending over 3.2 trillion dollars as medical care or... Uh, you know, I can't understand, every time election comes, everybody is talking about medic Medicare. Why in an affluent nation where there is choice of nourishment and lifestyle, there is so much ailments? Simply you're eat eating wrong, it's just eating wrong. Yeah. Yeah, nutrient-starved food, uh, chemicalized meat consumption. Uh, and over meat consumption. I've been plant-based for over 15 years. And, you know, even if people don't want to give it up totally, that they can cut it uh, severely in half and take those subsidies uh, out of the economy and turn it into the agricultural space and planting those trees. I really love all of that that you're doing because it's... Uh, we found this in Brazil as well, because it's such a, a emphasis on putting cattle on the land. Um, wh what would you say then to the economy of a farmer? Because we've talked about, and I've talked to with Dr. Zach Bush, uh, Farmer's Footprint, about regenerative agriculture. There's a lot of initiatives with that and, and, and reforesting and refooding uh, with multiple crops. Um, what would you say in terms of... Uh, to farmers and to people in that area, because I love it's it's really mobilizing the private sector and and at least starting with planting trees in the areas that they can, uh, if they don't feel they can completely convert. Uh, what what would you say is initiative there that you could uh, talk to those kinds of people? About? See, we have we have evolved various modules, 
various modules for different types of land and soil and different types of economic requirements. There are farmers who are hundred percent involved in their land. For them, we have one kind of module. There are other kind of farmers who would like to be partially involved, rest of the time they got a job or a business or something. So for different types of people, about six to seven different modules and formats are there, successful modules, because we have thousands of farmers who are successfully doing this, greatly enhancing their income. Greatly means three hundred to eight hundred percent increase in their income, plus the soil quality has improved significantly, water tables have come up in that region, and the nutrient quality of the food that they're growing is very, very high. The same crop that is being grown along with the trees and the crop that is grown in the next farm, next piece of land right there, the nutrient quality is significantly different. We have shown this with agriculture, agriculture universities have experimented this and shown that it's significantly different. So, the farmers can be rest assured that this is not a problem. This is a great solution for them. Only thing is, maybe first three, four years, the governments will have to support. Mm -hmm. This is yeah. needed. And another thing is producing quality saplings. This is where we are very significant. Right now, our saplings cost forty-two rupees, that means approximately about sixty cents. Well, commercial farms are growing things. This happened in a, you know, very premier agriculture university where they, we were all asked to take our saplings for study. Out of twenty-seven uh, nurseries from across southern India, they brought their saplings. All of them, twenty-sixth of them, had nematoid nodules in their uh, roots. Our nursery was the only one, because this is run by volunteers, dedicated people, was the only one without that. Well, their were, plants were all like this, ours was like this, but this is important, because if you... this is because you put a lot of urea and whatever, plant has grown big. They are taking three to four months to grow the same sapling, we are taking nine to ten months to grow the same sapling. That is a big difference, because if you give these saplings with nematoid uh, nodules, then the farmer will grow it and after five years he discover... he will discover he's been duped. It will take five, six years for him to understand that he's been duped by this. Then the entire movement will fail. It's extremely important, the farmers who shift are super successful. Right now our objective is just this one river with 5.2 million farmers. All of you guys in from California must join because this is not about one river in India. If this module succeed, succeeds, which it will, it's a question of time, how quickly we make it happen. If we make this happen within the next four to six years' time, and in another six years' time, we can show the results of how river will rejuvenate itself. If this happens, then the entire tropical band, the United Nations is very keen to see that this module gets established in the entire tropical band. If uh, people are unaware of this, a planting a tree in a temperate climate, let's say here we are in Tennessee, we plant a tree, and we plant the same tree somewhere in a tropical climate, its... its ability to sequester carbon and water is almost three times higher. It's very important the trees go in the tropical belt. Yes, absolutely. Uh, incredible information. Where can people find those modules, those different modules for the farmers? Do you have... do you have a website or a link? Yes, there are... Can... Uh, there are websites. It's called Kaveri Calling. Beautiful. We'll put it in the show notes. I know that you have to go and you have other... Uh, I have a million questions. We'll... we'll do this again and maybe we'll even meet in India and... and do it yes. there. Uh, but I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you. your your love for the trees, for the planet, for the ecology, and for motorcycles. Um, <laughs> My love is for life, so all this included. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, bless you. Bless, you. bless your work, and we'll we'll be in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.